We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, I'm Michael Jacoby Brown, your host of We Hold These Truths. And today we're very lucky to have with us Lou Patty, uh, owner and operator of Gray Patty Auto. Great Patty Auto has been in Arlington for almost 50 years. Lou's been working there. And when we think about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, liberty often involves transportation. And I don't know about you or what planet you live on, but to get around Boston, uh, unless you got all day and don't worry about uh, you know, standing outside at a freezing bus stop for a half an hour, you need a car to have any kind of liberty. I often work in different parts of Boston, and I drive there. And one of the reasons I drive there is because Lou Patty, for the last, oh, more than 20 years, has made sure my cars are able to get up and go every morning. And uh, Lou's been working on cars for over 50 years, so uh, Lou's really an important part of anyone who cares about liberty, because getting around in this city, in this country, in this state, really often requires a car. So, Lou, welcome. It's nice to have you here, and uh, thanks for being here. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about uh, where you were born and how you ended up coming to Arlington. Well, nice to be here, Michael. Thank you thanks. very much. Um, well, I came here as an immigrant. Uh, I immigrated from uh, Belgium in 1961. And wow. after a short stay mm -hmm. in Somerville, Mass, uh, we moved to East Arlington mm. in about 1966. Wow. And, and how did you get involved in the auto repair business? Tell us a little bit about it. Um, just uh, while growing up, I was involved with um, uh, people that were um, mechanics. Yeah. Mechanics, crackerjack mechanics, hmm. um, and I was self-taught. Uh, really? A lot of things that I did, you know, started out with small engines hmm. um, until, uh, again, I uh, ran into some mechanics that were um, kind enough to teach me um, a lot of stuff. Well, where, where was that? Well, actually, I ran into uh, a mechanic working at Mahoney's Rocky Ledge Farm when I was old enough to get my working papers. I think back mm. in the day you could get your working papers at 14 or 15 right. years old. Yep. And um, right. immediately this, um, this mechanic uh, recognized the fact that I could be really helpful mm -hmm. around the machines uh, that they owned at the farm. Mm. Really? You had an aptitude for I, I just yeah. kind of had a knack for it. Yeah, I think. no, it's great. People, some people are good at that, and some people it, not necessarily. It, it was something that came naturally to me. Yeah, and so tell us a little bit about starting Gray Patty. I mean, many of us know uh, Steve Gray, unfortunately. Unfortunately we passed away he died way uh, too six young years from, ago. Yeah. Um, I started at the gas station in, in 1974, 
um, really sweeping floors and uh, pumping gas. Which gas station was this? This was a Sunoco gas station that used to be across from Arlington High School. Oh, right. No okay. longer there. Right. Um, so I started there, and he, um, Steve, recognized the fact that I was worth a little more than just sweeping floors. <laughs> and uh, at the time, I, I had graduated high school in 1974, and mm. after I took uh, some automotive classes at high school, mm. uh, I enrolled in a program at Benjamin Franklin Institute of Boston in oh, 1974 really? oh. and graduated in 1976. Um, huh. At the same time, w working for Steve Gray. Uh -huh. uh, and not only pumping gas, but working on automobiles under uh, the supervision of uh, another mechanic that I met in my life that helped me out a lot. Who was that? His what name was, was John Anderson. John Anderson. Yes. It's good to say their names, because yeah. that's how we learn from, yeah, from people. And he was really good to me. He really helped me out a lot. He right. taught now, me a lot. Now, is he still around? He is retired. But he's still uh, around. Uh, he's still around, yeah. Oh, that's great. And he taught you a lot. And yes. tell us a little bit about uh, starting Gray Patty Auto. I know that was almost well, 50 years ago I now, started right? at, uh, in 1974. And in 1980, after working for Steve uh, for six years, obviously, um, he offered me uh, a share in the business, a half share in the business. Really? Wow. And, and, I, and I accepted, of course. And, and he needed somebody that he could trust, mm -hmm. that he thought he could trust, um, well. to take care of business when, so that he could take some time off and he could enjoy life a little more than just working. Yeah. Gas station businesses, the hours are just endless. What's it like? It, it's tough. It's what, tough what do you mean? with the regulations uh, and back then the paperwork involved in, um, in dispensing gasoline, purchasing, uh, storing and dispensing gasoline. It was just, it was 24 hours a day. Really? What do you have to do? Because I think a lot of people well, don't know Well, there was that. a lot of state and federal regulations uh, that came into play in the 70s that made it very difficult to, um, to handle the product. Really? And uh -huh. the oil company uh, was tough on their dealers. Uh, earlier in the 60s, let's say maybe the early 70s, um, the oil companies worked for the dealers. Um, really, but uh -huh. in the in the eighties, late eighties, the nineties, the dealers started working for the oil companies, and the oil companies became very strict on their pricing structures. Uh -huh. They wanted their product to sell more than the product up the street, than the than the gasoline station up the street, and it was a uh -huh. very competitive market. Really, it really it was tough. Yeah. Well, it's let's talk show. about cars themselves. You've been doing this for since the '60s, right? No. Since well, uh, the '70s. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, in the '70s, uh, I time. was working on '60s cars, maybe even some late '50s cars that people still had around. Right. Uh, so yeah, the the '50s and '60s technology was uh, at our doorstep uh, when I was first right. starting in the business. Right. So how have cars and now you've been repairing cars too, keeping people's liberty going for a long time. How have cars changed over uh, all those years? The biggest changes have been um, in uh, manufacturing, of course, uh, <coughs> a lot of uh, lighter materials, um, a lot of plastics. Um, big changes came to um, the, um, the emissions and hmm. safety standards that the country, this country, was developing uh, to try and create a product that would be less intrusive to our environment. Hmm. In the middle 70s, um, the EPA, uh, I believe, was formed, and that was, mm -hmm. uh, that was a big hit for the auto manufacturers because it was crunch time. It was time to clean up the tailpipe. Mm -hmm. uh, so the automobile manufacturing really uh, had a big job on their hands. Mm -hmm. um, the sixties were very dirty. The fifties were even dirtier. Uh, the automobiles. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, and if it wasn't for the EPA implementing these rules and regulations on an escalating basis every year, the the automobiles had to uh, the manufacturers had to provide uh, automobiles within their whole fleet that they offer to the public uh, a certain number, a certain miles per gallon number. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that they had called cafe regulations. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for the uh, introduction of all these rules and regulations, uh, although as strict as they were, um, it'd be a lot dirtier around here. The mm -hmm. air would be unbreathable. Um, really? So uh, I think that uh, it was a, a good measure uh, by the U.S. government to um, to implement some kind of uh, strategy to yeah. clean up the air. Yeah. Well, a lot of people now obviously are concerned about global warming because mm -hmm. cars, you know, most cars except for electric cars produce emissions that create uh, uh, the carbon in the atmosphere, which is causing all these storms and fires and all over the place. And yet most people to get around still need a car. I mean, to get to work, I mean, my wife drove to Brigham and Women's Hospital this morning. You know, sometimes she can ride her bike and take the bus uh, or the subway, uh, but sometimes it's just not working. And in Boston's weather, a lot of times uh, it's pretty uncomfortable to stand outside when it's 20 degrees waiting on Mass Ave for the bus, for the bus could take... I mean, I've been waiting out there sometimes when I do take it, you know, 20, 25 minutes. So cars, unless something really changes, are going to be with us. I agree. So uh, how do you see the future of cars and personal transportation? You're someone that's been, you know, so to speak, uh, on the front lines for decades. Uh, I, um, the future of cars. Uh, well, I think the future is um, is pretty evident that the manufacturers involved around the world are um, no longer going to produce gasoline-powered automobiles right, or yeah. fossil fuel-powered automobiles. Um, uh, a lot of the manufacturers have stated that. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to go to the next best thing, which is, I think, the next subject. Electric was the car. the electric car thing. Right. We have some of um, them, but not a lot. Right. Not a lot, not a lot. Um, I think that the future of the automobile, uh, I, I, I still think it's going to have four wheels. Um, I I yeah. recently when a wheel falls off, well, I've had that then happen you got three, that happens also. Yeah, that's um, kind of dangerous. I had um, one fall off at about 60 miles an hour once. Uh, it was not a that's happy... A, uh, that's an experience. Yeah, really. Um, I could live without it, probably. <laughs> I, uh, I see, uh, I recently read an article about the, uh, again, uh, a Woburn company, uh, that builds flying automobiles. What? Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not so hip on that. But flying automobiles have been produced for for decades. They just uh, so they just never got off the ground, so to speak. Really? Sometimes uh, I like to have one when I'm stuck in a traffic jam. What do they go over the cars just, in front it, of you? It or? Just, I, I just don't get it. I mean, you know, you gotta you gotta take off somewhere. And you gotta land somewhere. Do they have stop at red lights? Uh, I <laughs> When they're not flying, yeah. I think they're called helicopters, uh, aren't they? No, no. It's actually, with with wings and you know, and uh, the, the amount of passengers depends on how much power uh, is built into it. Um, it's it's pretty strange. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. No, I mean, no, I could just see them crashing soon. into each other. Uh, uh, that would be... Uh, if it's got an engine, it's going to be uh, a problem. Yeah, so um, uh, what, what, so what about the electric cars? What's well, it, like 2% uh, of cars two, in these um, states? According to AAA, uh, John Paul, I believe, is, is yeah. the gentleman's name. Uh, I, uh, the Arlington Advocate recently had an article. Uh, John Paul spoke at the Arlington Men's Club, uh, retired Men's Club of Arlington, excuse me. And... Um, he stated the fact that right now uh, this country is utilizing uh, approximately two, well, approximately accurately, two percent of the vehicles in this country now are electric. Mm -hmm. And if there's a sudden rise in that percentage uh, of vehicles in this country, it's going to present a problem with the electrical grid. Mm -hmm. the, available electricity is not there. 
Uh, now, I, this morning I heard that part of uh, the president's uh, push on the structure, uh, the, the, the whole structure deal, uh, yeah. they want to fix all the bridges, they want to fix everything. Uh, yeah. Part of it was uh, installing charge stations all over the country, mm -hmm. and the government is going to um, fund that, subsidize it possibly. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think that should have been taken care of before the electric car really started becoming more popular. Uh, personally, I think that the hybrid product is still makes more sense. Uh huh. Why uh, is that? Because you've always got a filling station around. Uh -huh. You know, a filling station to me is whether you're filling it up with uh, diesel fuel or gasoline uh -huh. or electricity. Right. How come all the gas stations in Arlington or in any town, city, how come there are no charge stations at all of these areas? It no. is a filling station, right? Good question, yeah. Well, what do you yeah. think it would take to change that? I mean, you know cars themselves. Are the electric cars, uh, what, what are they, I don't know if you repair them or if they we need repair? We do not repair them. Uh, and we are limited on the hybrid car repair uh, simply because I haven't taken advantage of the education available. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, uh, I think it's going to take a few years <coughs> to learn how to repair the cars properly, the electric part of the hybrid cars. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, I'm at the end of my. After 50 years or after more. After 50 years, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to stop. Um, trying to learn about new stuff, and that may be the wrong approach, but I'm more comfortable trying to sustain um, mm -hmm. uh, the energy and the, and the repairability that, that I can handle now yeah. uh, at this stage of the game. Uh, but I still think uh, that hybrid is the way to go. Uh, electric cars, uh, electric cars are going to put people like me out of business. Oh, really? Personally. Oh. Yeah. Now, uh, the maintenance the maintenance on the electric cars is pretty much, uh, I'm not going to say non-existent, um, but uh, it's a much cleaner operating vehicle, um, and, and, and that's part of the reason it's eventually going to become more popular. Uh, but it's less moving parts. Really? Um, we don't have all kinds of transmissions and transfer cases and engines to uh, to all orchestrate uh, uh, properly to make this vehicle go down the road. Really? And uh, not only here on Mass Ave, but uh, on the highway at 60, 70, and 80 miles per hour safely. The electric car is just uh, incredible. Really? The electric car just at the snap of a finger. No noise, no... But it must have some moving parts. I mean, the wheels got to move. It's, the it's axle got moving parts. Must have axles. But, but I, uh, I'd say less than half as much as a conventional automobile. Probably twenty-five percent. So, do you think it'll be what it'll be like in terms of repair and longevity? Will they? I mean, my Toyota, the little Prius you've been fixing <coughs> for, I can't remember. Long, long time. time. Long, long time. time. Right. Thank you, Lou. Um, uh, that's got a hundred and seventy-two thousand plus miles on it had it for, I don't know, 10 years? It's essentially, years? you know, you take the electric out of that car, that automobile, and it's just, uh, it's like a conventional automobile. Uh, does the electric part of it uh, actually uh, uh, create more longevity as far as, uh, as far as how long the vehicle lives? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't uh -huh. know. Apparently, it, it does a pretty good job because there's a lot of Priuses out there, older Priuses. Right. Uh, that that are still going, um, and th they're still in pretty decent shape. Right, but th but they're not totally electric. They're hybrid. They're not totally electric. They still right. have a small gasoline engine. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, it's not overworked. I I couldn't I can't tell you I couldn't tell you if I've ever seen a Prius that I that I personally have had to replace an engine. Really. They just, if properly maintained, uh, right. I think that uh, that car will go 300,000 miles. If it doesn't rust away, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, everything 
uh, as far as uh, if it doesn't get crashed, if it doesn't rust away. There's a handful of things that are going to go wrong, but it's it, totally acceptable. Right. Well, what would it take uh, to have, in terms of you know improving the environment, and if electric cars are the future? You said a lot of manufacturers are going to be only making electric cars. Only making, uh, I don't know if strictly, uh, for example, Volvo announced uh, yeah, maybe so last yeah. year that they were, in five years or in four years, they were not going to sell an uh, internal combustion automobile. Uh, uh, but, well, okay, so that answers, I answered my yeah. own question. Internal combustion means that it's not going to be a hybrid. Right. It's not going to be a hybrid, uh, a hybrid in, in either way. It's going to be totally electric. Right. So it's got to be a plug-in. Or it's got right. to have some kind of means of uh, recharge. But what would it take to have more electric cars? You said there aren't enough charging stations. The infrastructure is not there. I mean, what would specifically do you think it would take to... It would take uh, electrical uh, generation, uh, bigger power plants, larger power plants, more solar. Mm -hmm. You know, solar uh, to, to provide electricity to power the automobiles. I'm not an uh, electrical engineer uh, mm -hmm. by any means. Um, I would think that the 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 charge um, the charge thing would have already been implemented. Um, it's kind of like taking the, the carriage before the horse. Right. Uh, uh, we've got the product. The product is here. But, but not I enough. think if you you talk to you talk to some people and they say this is not my travel car. If I want to travel, yeah. I'm going to take the Prius. Right. You know, I'm not going to take the Tesla. They have to, really? Uh, okay. You know, I'm going to keep my Tesla, but it's going to stay inside a 128. Really? You know, and I'll have a, 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 I'll be fine with that because I'll never have to worry about recharging it. Yeah. But if I'm going to drive out to Ohio, yeah. Although I I'm told you a friend, my yeah, a friend of mine drove from Minneapolis to here in his Tesla. He said it was all. Oh, if you well, if you said own they, a Tesla, you need to be. Uh, uh, you need to have one of those p powerful phones that will tell you where all the charge yeah, stations are. Yeah, I guess that's are. what he did. And if there's other people at the charge station, you're going to be there for a while. I see. Right. It must take it's, a while. It doesn't charge right away. Oh, it's not like filling my car up with gas that not takes at five all. minutes. Right. So not at all. Might as well watch a movie. Well, what would you say to, you know, you've been doing this for 50 years, but cars are going to change. What would you say to young people thinking of getting into repairing cars it's a you know and i know there's some younger people now working it's, for it's you. kind of a tough question what, what would you what um, would you say to them what i see on my information databases that i have at the at the garage is uh you know if i look up a, a prius and i need some um, some specifications i just jump in i, I enter all my uh my information hmm. and it comes back and then i pick out what i need now if i go to tesla and my information database is updated every month. Really? Wow. There's no information on Tesla. Really? I can't even tell you how these automobiles get repaired. I'd like to someday go to a Tesla dealer and see what the mechanics are doing. I don't even think they have dealers. I think I you buy I them all uh, online. So, so you know, that, that being said, uh, you know, what are your recommendations to, to a young kid who wants to get into the automobile industry yeah. uh, stick it out and and just work on automobiles until everything's electric how long is that going to be yeah. i think it's going to be a while i think you probably uh another 25 years yeah, well. i think after 25 years you're not going to see the corner garage anymore really and this you know that i could be totally wrong but well, the way I see it, yeah, it's no, going, I can't. I can't afford to buy the uh, the computer uh, networks uh, and the <laughs> software to work on these automobiles today. Really? I would have to specialize on, for example, VW, and buy all the equipment just to work on VW really? to, to to repair the product accurately. Uh, or BMW, it's the same thing. The software and the hardware from either manufacturing base is not going to, I'm not going to be able to use it on a, well, another manufacturer's product. And it's the same thing with Chevrolet, and it's the same thing with whatever brand is being produced at this time. So it's very expensive to very buy expensive all the data? Very expensive, and it's to, to be able to, okay, so 
just a quick example, when we were at the gas station, um, uh, we got along with the Buick dealership down the street. I bought a lot of parts for GMs uh, through the Buick dealership, which is no longer there, by right, the way, yeah. which is a CVS now. Right. And um, they worked on Buicks. And, boy, if I had a problem with a Buick and I couldn't figure it out, I'd go down and see my buddy and say, hey, you know, what do I do with this? And and he'd be like, oh, well, you know, you look in this area, and, and he'd give me some pointers. But if an Asian car ever came into their shop, you know, everybody was just, well, what do we do with this? Send it to Great they Patty. They say, hey, <laughs> let me, I'm going to go up and see Lou and Steve. Right. And, and see what they can tell me about this. Right. When the Asian automobiles came to this country immediately they were in our shop right getting maintained more than ma maintenance they were getting repaired they were no better than the american cars in any way until right. more recently until now they are the late 80s the early 90s yeah. but back to the fact that you know uh somebody i, I see that uh, uh minuteman tech has just uh, reorganized Right, and yep. they've even changed the name. Uh, I'm not sure Minute about Man that. Regional. Really, or, they no. changed the name, uh, but they're still keeping the automotive technology program. And uh, I, I and I say that because I think my daughter had showed me what the tuition base was. Now, there, right. there is a tuition base now yeah. at uh, Minuteman Tech. Um, w w how, I, 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 I don't know what I would recommend as far as somebody that wanted to get into automotive technology okay. nowadays. Okay, it's like going to change. Like I said, I, I think it's, it's changing. It's ever-changing. Yeah. You have to be more computer literate than us dinosaurs. Well, you're no dinosaur. Well, I want to thank you, Lou. Uh, our time's about up, but uh, I want to thank you. You've been <laughs> taking you care not only of my car, but probably half the people in Arlington's cars. And when we talk about keeping... Uh, uh, the truths of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, I know for one, and I bet for many of you, being able to have an automobile that's uh, reliable. Uh, you want to go to uh, Lou Patty, uh, you know, Great Patty Auto on Mass Ave in Arlington to have it fixed. And part of liberty is to be able to uh, get around. And I don't know what the future of personal transportation or public transportation is going to be, but... I, I think I agree with Lou Patty that cars are going to be with us for a long time. So thanks for tuning in. My name's Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host of We Hold These Truths. We were really honored to have Lou Patty of Great Patty Auto, uh, Arlington Institution, with us today. And we hope you'll tune in next time. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>